Please welcome David Rubenstein, President of the Economic Club of Washington, D.C. Welcome everyone to our 11th virtual event since the Corona crisis began. Today we have four special guests. I'll just mention them now and then I'll give them a more prop a proper introduction a little bit later. Richard Ashworth, who is the President of Walgreens and Chairman of the National Association of Chain Drugstores, will be our first guest, followed by Dr. Gretchen Vanderveer, the CEO of Fair Chance. Uh, she will be followed by Dr. Wayne uh, A.I. Frederick, who is the president of Howard University. And then we will have in our final segment, segment Kurt Newman, who we've had before, but we've asked him to come back to talk about something that's arisen relating to COVID-19. He is the president and CEO of Children's National Health System. And our audience today consists not only of Economic Club of Washington members, but also members from the Economic Club of Chicago and New York and members of the diplomatic community. So let me now begin with Richard Ashworth. Uh, Richard, um, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Okay, Richard, you are, uh, let me give you a, a, a little introduction for people who do not know you. You're a native of Florida, went to Nova University, a pharmacist, and then as a, in high school, you began working for Walgreens and you worked your way up to be now the, uh, the president. Yep. So just in uh, the Chicago area where Walgreens is based, and uh, Walgreens is one of the largest uh, drugstore chains in the United States, obviously. And uh, you are also an MBA as well. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, okay. So uh, let me ask you at the outset, what is the biggest challenge that drugstores have right now? Uh, is it keeping supplies in there, uh, getting help? What, what is the biggest single challenge you have? You know, that's a great question, David, because we're, we're really focusing on creating the safest environment for, uh, you know, our customers and patients to be able to use for prescriptions and for essential products. So it's really about getting the products, which is, is the point you made, but also making sure customers and patients are using it. So trying to get drive through and trying to get straight to home, digital tools, things like that. So people can get the access to the prescriptions and essential uh, needs that they have. So how many new employees have you had to hire because of the demand? Yeah, we've hired over 10,000 uh, temporary workers. Now, many of those are being converted into full-time and part-time, but we spent a lot of time trying to get as many people, you know, a lot of people are out of, uh, out of employment, as you know, and so we worked with 50 other companies to try and work out a relationship where some of their furloughed or displaced employees can get, can get some work while we're still open and part of a, the essential workforce for, for America. Now, if I go to a Walgreens today, can I get a test for the COVID-19? Can anybody walk up and get a test? I, I was told by somebody, anybody get a test. Is that true? That's not true. No, you can't do that. So we've got 20 locations open right now. And a lot of our competitive friends, uh, Walmart, CVS, Rite Aid, and others are all opening up sites as well. And we're all trying to get as many going as possible. But there are requirements to be able to, uh, to receive the test. And so you have to go to, for us, you can go to walgreens.com and you can fill out the uh, the questionnaire to see if you qualify. And most of that's in partnership with the administration and with HHS. So making sure that the right people get the test. So uh, how much does it cost to get a test? Yeah, the tests are free. So there's no charge for the test. Okay. So uh, today, uh, are people waiting in lines when your store is open? And what product is the single most in demand or the second most in demand? Or, or what are the biggest three or four products that are in demand right now? Yeah, mo most of the time, the, the stores have really kind of normalized back to what you would normally experience when you go into uh, a Walgreens. There's a couple of uh, areas across the country, like New York and others, where it's a bit more uh, severe. And so you, you could get customers uh, kind of pooling before. We've done some things to create some special shopping hours for uh, vulnerable populations so that they can get access to the store without worrying about, uh, about crowds. In terms of product, it's the things that you're probably looking for too. So it's hand sanitizer, it's masks, it's Clorox wipes, it's toilet paper, it's all the things that are of high use, high frequency that you need, plus also things to keep you and your family safe. So um, are there things that you wanna be selling that people ask for, but you just can't get right now because of demand or whatever supply chain problems there are? Yeah, we're working really well with, the, with our supplier partners and everyone's trying to get as much of this product available to, to the public as fast as possible. But there's still some constrained, uh, constrained supply on things like sanitizer and Clorox wipes. Those are probably two that are the most still hard to find. We get them and uh, you know, our partners are doing a good job getting it to us. Same with all of our uh, competitive friends. But the reality is as soon as we get it in, it comes right out the door. So uh, what about if you uh, need a prescription for something? Uh, what, are, what is uh, the most sought after uh, drug now that for which a prescription is needed? 
And they're not really COVID related. You know, the, the normal conditions that people live with each and every day, the chronic diseases they have, and high blood pressure is one of the most common. So we still have a, a significant amount of demand for those, uh, those products that treat uh, high blood pressure. And the good news is, is that the, the drug supply chain is, is, is pretty stable. And so uh, we're going to be working with uh, Amerisource Bergen, who's our partner, Steve and his team, to make sure that we've got the right products, uh, products uh, medicines available for, for patients. Now, during the regular season, you give uh, flu shots. You provide flu shots. Is that right? That's correct. And um, who is trained to give the flu shots? Uh, as a pharmacist, when you go to a pharmacy school, they teach you how to give a flu shot. Is that part of the training? They do now. Not when I went to pharmacy school, but they definitely do now. Uh, all of our, and all of our pharmacists who are working at Walgreens have all been trained. So all 26,000 are, are certified immunizers, meaning they know how to do immunizations. That's not just flu, that's pneumo, that's smallpox, that's me, all of them we can do. Um, what's good about uh, pharmacy though, is that it's so accessible because it's in every community. We're within 75% of all Americans are within five miles of a Walgreens. So to get access to a vaccination, which today could be flu or pneumo, but tomorrow could be COVID-19, is really a big part of uh, the story we're trying to get out is the value of community pharmacy. Suppose I am really concerned about going out and seeing anybody I just want to be staying in my house. Can I get your products delivered by mail somehow? Or how do you do that with people? Yeah, absolutely. So you can go online and just have it shipped straight to your home. You can do that. It's not a problem. Uh, we've actually launched now uh, nationwide uh, a relationship with Postmates. So they can go directly from the store directly to your home. You can also buy online and pick up in our drive through We've got um, you know, a lot of health and OTC type products where you can just stay in your car and pick up and drive through And we'll be launching later this month, uh, buy online and pick up at the curb. So you can just be in the parking lot and we'll bring it to you. So you are based in Illinois and the suburb of Chicago. Um, is your, are your offices closed? Correct, yeah. The governor in Illinois has uh, made a shelter in place. And so we've adhered to that, of course. Uh, and so our offices are essentially closed. Uh, very, very few amount of people uh, are in any of the buildings right now and everyone is working remote. So how, um, how hard is it for you to manage your large number of employees remotely? Do you, you know, how do you do it once a day? You talk to your senior people, or how do you do that? Yeah, good question. I, you know, that's a big point, which is we've really ramped up the frequency of the communication during something like this, because when everyone first started working remote and remember our stores are still alive and physical and with consumers. So they're not, they're not working remote. It's the support office people, you know, at the, at the headquarters that are doing that. And that took some adjustments uh, for the individual employees and for management. So we, we, we do uh, weekly with the, you know, kind of um, leadership level. And then uh, the field is actually having frequent, uh, almost daily conversations with stores to keep them apprised on what's happening. So when this is over, do you expect that uh, you will change the way you operate the company in the future? Will you have more people staying at home? Or how do you think the world will change or your company will change as a result of this experience? I think it will change. Uh, to what degree and for how long, I'm not entirely certain. But there's a lot of new muscle uh, that this organization has developed through, through this situation. And we don't want to lose those. And so, you know, how we talk to employees and some of the new processes we have in store, I expect a lot of those will remain, uh, you know, in the new normal, whatever that might be. Uh, that uh, customers will see a different Walgreens tomorrow. So we're accelerating all of our online and digital uh, capabilities. One of our big strategic pillars is to digitalize the company. And so COVID has really just been a catalyst or an accelerator for that from a consumer behavior perspective. So if I go to a Walgreens and I want to check out something, buy something, do you have a process where I have to stand six feet away from somebody else in the line? Or how does that work in terms of social distancing? Yeah, good question. We've done a lot in stores. So a couple things. One is, yes, we have you know, social distancing signage. We have, uh, you know, circles on the, on the floor to tell you where to stand. We have plexiglass shields in front of our employees to protect them from, you know, any droplets or anything moving uh, during the interaction, which is a little closer uh, together. We have hand sanitizer at every checkout. All of our employees have masks. We ask all of our customers to also uh, wear masks. We have deep sanitization that is done in the stores, plus we have uh, daily cleaning. So quite a bit of activity to make the store experience uh, very safe. So if I go to your store and say, look, I, I, I drove 10 miles to get to your store. I left my mask at home. Can I just come in and just pick up something? What do you say? Well, it's a, it's a tough situation. So we, we, we implore all of our customers to please adhere to uh, wearing a mask. But we also ask that our store employees do not engage uh, with customers who choose not to. I don't want to put any of our employees okay. at risk or in danger of having any uh, negative altercations. Have By any and large, everyone's following the rules there, David. Most, most okay. people are following them. 
So have any of your employees uh, come down with COVID-19? Unfortunately, yeah, you know, we have a couple hundred thousand employees, so you can, you know, uh, just do the proxy for the infection rate for the country. And it's been a big part of our focus is making sure we're doing what we can to help them when they're either are positive and they have a confirmed diagnosis, or even if they're presumed positive, meaning they haven't had access to a test, but the symptoms seem very similar. And so we have a lot of processes to help those, uh, uh, those employees. Throughout the course of history, when products are in great demand, people who sell those products often raise the prices a little bit more than they normally do. So are you raising the prices for sanitizers or, or other things that are in great demand now? Absolutely not. In fact, back right before uh, it really became you know, what it is today, where we in that early March timeframe when we were you know, trying to understand what this was going to mean for America, uh, we immediately held all price increases across the, the board and continue that way. So we're, we're being very sensitive to that. This is a time where this is just about taking care of the American people and doing that in the best way possible. So it's really about supply and getting it to as many people as possible. We did some rationing of supplies in the beginning where we asked customers to take one or two of something so that we could spread out and get it to as many households as possible. Now the current positions you have as the head of Walgreens and the head of the chain drugstore uh, association, you only had those for like two months before this happened. So mm -hmm. is that uh, something that you've been worried about that you have bad luck or something or, or what did your predecessors say? Are they, say uh, they're happy to be gone from the positions that you now have? You know, I think uh, it's, it's interesting. You know, I've been here 28 years, so there's been quite a bit of training, if you think of it that way. Uh, but no, I, I would say that uh, I'm honored to be able to lead it. Uh, and I've been, been here for a long time and I love, the, I love the company and I love the people. And so it's really about just doing what's right for, for them. Look, we're all operating without a playbook here. Uh, we have a business continuity plan, a very robust one, as, as I'm sure most organizations and corporations do. It didn't, it didn't think about this exact situation. So we're just doing the best decision we can with the information we have. And then getting as much information is also another big part of, of how we're operating. So far, I've been really proud of, right. uh, of this organization, the leaders, but all, more importantly, the people in stores who are taking care of customers every day. Now you're self-isolating like other people who work at Walgreens, other people who are probably watching now. Um, what is it like? Do you have two young children at home? Are they happy to have you home as much as they are now or not? I think they were up front, David. I'm not sure. It depends on the day. Today, I would think would be a good day. They're both Zooming over in the other room with their teachers right now. Uh, depending on how much screen time I allow, depends on how happy they are with me being home. So in your judgment, um, is the business of uh, 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 chain drugstores doing reasonably well across the board now because there's a lot of demand? Is it, or is it really not much different than it normally was? It's harder, it's harder for everybody. I think all of retail, either essential or non-essential, it's hard. You know, a lot of people are without work. A lot of people have, uh, have anxiety and are concerned about the future. And so that, that has impact on your behavior, your spending behavior, and your consumption of healthcare. And so actually NACDS today, we, we launched our Reopening America for Pharmacies playbook. And I'm really excited about this because it talks about how pharmacy can really help people maximize this environment for themselves, where they can do the best in the current uh, current situation. But pharmacy is, a, is an underutilized resource, David. We, we can use pharmacy so much more in this country than we do right now, and it can make a big difference for the overall health of, uh, of our community. So when you go to, you need to go buy supplies. I assume they don't deliver into your house so much. You go in into the store, you go to Walgreens or you go to CVS? I go to both. Uh, I go to all of our, uh, all, all of retail quite often. In terms of purchasing, it's pretty much just Walgreens. And when you go into Walgreens, they recognize you and you get, you get to the front of the line or what? Uh, the first part, yes. The second part, no. Uh, I, tend, I tend to let customers go ahead. Uh, but getting recognized, it's a fairly common experience. So if you're in a line, standing in a line or something and somebody is complaining about something, you don't say, I am the president, I can fix that. Or <laughs> you, don't, you just be quiet. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen very often. Actually, what I mostly get is people stopping me to compliment the store. And I would say when, when things don't go right, our store teams are really good at making it right. And so they don't need my intervention or my help when I'm, uh, when I'm in the store. So if a vaccine uh, is developed, you would expect that your pharmacists would be the people who would be the ones who injected the people? Is that what they're going to be trained to do? Yes, they're already trained to be able to do, the, to do an injection. And the COVID-19 injection would be similar to the ones that we do now, so that's my sincere hope. I was really pleased with HHS when uh, they came out and, 
and said pharmacy can help you know conduct the test for uh, COVID and be able to uh, to to do the um, you know the, the process to determine who's eligible for it. That was a big step forward for pharmacy, and I really want to see that continue and also go to more services that pharmacy is more than equipped to do. So today, what about small uh, drug stores? You may not represent them in your trade association. I'm not sure. But like, let's suppose mom and pop pharmacies, of which there's still plenty around the United States, sure. are they able to survive and compete in this environment now? I think they're dealing with the same challenges that, you know, someone of uh, like a Walgreens or a CVS or a Rite Aid or Walmart would deal with. And, you know, I'm a big advocate for community pharmacy, whether it be independence, our own pharmacies or others, because I think the value of pharmacy is what really matters. And that local accessible healthcare. Pharmacists are on every corner in America and they're honestly just there to help. Like, you know, their mindset, our training, our intention is all positive just to just to help consumers and help patients with, you know, the healthcare challenges or essential needs that they that they have. So in this environment, uh, I would expect maybe you have more demand for Viagra than normal. Is it that the case or that's not the case? That's actually quite the inverse. You might think so, but most of the discretionary type medicines are you know, a little bit in decline. Uh, what we're really focused on is those that are for, you know, chronic conditions, people who have very serious ailments uh, through our specialty business or through our, you know, traditional business that you see, you know, on the corner. And uh, that's what we're really focusing on. We got great partnership with that, with Amerisource Bergen to make sure we stay in good stock on the drug supply chain so that customers and patients, whatever their physicians are writing for, we have it for them. So if the federal government officials might be watching people in Congress or in the administration, what would you ask them that they could do to help your industry beyond what they've already done, or you don't really need any help? Well, I think this is all new. So we're really proud of the public-private partnership that we have with, uh, with the administration to get all these testing sites set up. And like I said, I think pharmacy could just play a much bigger role, especially during a pandemic, and testing is a great example of that. What I would ask is just continue to work with pharmacy uh, on how to best utilize pharmacists, whether that makes them part of the ability to do services in all the states across the country uh, for more than what they're authorized to do now. So why do you think it was at the beginning of this crisis that people started stockpiling toilet paper? Was there a, some historic reason why that was thought to likely to be running out of, uh, of the stores or what? Yeah, I don't know the deep customer insights there, but I was actually one who wanted to make sure I had that as well. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just norm normal human behavior to protect yourself and your family and, and essential needs, things you use every day, all the time. And it wasn't just toilet paper, that made the news a lot, but there were many other products that people were, uh, were trying to get as much of into the home as, as possible. You've seen tons of reports on the food supply chain, you know, and on, on the cleaning supply chain, et cetera. And so there was a lot of demand for products where, you know, sales and, and demand were, were, were very high. I think people generally overreacted to that. I think we can all kind of agree. Um, but uh, I don't know exactly why, but it definitely happened. Suppose somebody goes into one of your stores and uh, says, I, I'd like to get some hand sanitizers and you have, let's say 50 hand sanitizers and they want to buy them all. Is, can somebody buy them all or do you limit how much they can take of something? Yeah, we're still limiting supply on those kind of, you know, core COVID related uh, products and hand sanitizer would be one. And I, you know, it's hard to enforce. Uh, and I know sometimes people do get frustrated with that, but what we ask is that people just be, you know, considerate of, uh, of their neighbors and others in their community that we want to get as much of these, you know, safe products to as many people as possible. So I'm not a member of your, um, I guess you have some kind of uh, frequent user club or something like that. I assume you have that. So uh, if I actually was a member of that, uh, how much would I save by being a member, by the way? Yeah, so good question. Well, and I can help you after to become a member. It's not very right. hard. Or you can just go to any one of our stores and sign up within, within a minute or two. Uh, it gives you all kinds of benefits. So you get points uh, whenever, you're, uh, whenever you buy products from us, and those points can be translated into future discounts. And you get all the sale prices whenever you are, are a Balance right. Rewards member. The reason I'm not a member is I think I'm always afraid I'll get on your email uh, distribution thing for the rest of my life, and I'll be getting emails from people for the rest of my life. Is that a problem or not? I shouldn't worry about that. You should not worry about that. If that's something you're worried about, we can absolutely make that not okay. part of the program for you. Okay, so the most important message you would like to convey to our watchers and to everybody in America about the, uh, train drug store, the chain drug stores and Walgreens is what? Yeah, I think the main thing is, is that we're here to help you with all of your healthcare needs. We can do that in a very safe, environment and we're all in this together. So it's really just about community pharmacy helping their communities to be able to get access to the products and medicines that they need. We're here for you. 
And around the world, uh, do you think there's any place that's as good as the United States for pharmacies in terms of accessibility and, and the availability of products? Or just, you know, I know your company has uh, facilities elsewhere as well, but, but in, in, around the world, is there anything that you think is comparable to the United States in terms of availability of pharmacies and drugstores? Yeah, there's, there's quite a bit actually of similarities in European markets versus the uh, United States. In, in Asia, the pharmacies are a bit smaller and they're a bit more frequent. In the US, they're a little bit bigger. And in uh, Europe, they're a little bit uh, kind of in the middle in terms of size. Uh, that's a generality. What I would say is there's positives and negatives to all of those different countries. And what we try and okay. do as a global organization is learn from those and, and apply the best ones in each of the countries we're in. Okay, well, I'm going to go find my closest Walgreens this afternoon and tell them that the uh, president said that I can get all the hand sanitizers I want and <laughs> anything else, and that I could be a member of his uh, frequent flyer club, in effect, discount yeah, club. You, you can go say those things, David. Good luck with that. I think our store teams know better. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. I appreciate it. No, I really appreciate the time. Thank you for all having right. me. Bye. So now I would like to talk uh, to Gretchen Vanderveer. Uh, Gretchen, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, David. Okay. So Gretchen is the Chief Executive Officer of Fair Chance. Uh, she is uh, a native of Ohio, graduate of the University of Cincinnati, graduate of the University of Vermont, and PhD from the University of Maryland. And uh, she has been in the nonprofit area for 25 years and has been for the, the CEO of Fair Chance Bank for seven years. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so for those people that don't know what Fair Chance does, can you just briefly describe what Fair Chance is? Absolutely, and first just let me say it's a pleasure to be here this morning along with your other distinguished guests. But David, at Fair Chance, we envision a city and a nation where every child succeeds. And we're essentially a social change organization with a network of about 120 community-based nonprofits across Washington, D.C. and Prince George's County. And our mission is to strengthen nonprofits to achieve life-changing results for children and youth experiencing poverty. So what do I mean by strengthening nonprofits? Well, in some respects, we're similar to a consulting firm, a Deloitte, a Booz Allen, an Accenture, in that we partner with these organizations to strengthen their systems and their structures so that they are better able to measure their results, expand their services, and make the world better for children and youth that are struggling. And, um, but we don't charge fees. We raise money from donors, grants, contracts um, to provide our services for free because the organizations that we select through a very rigorous process, by the way, um, could not afford to pay for our services. So we've been working um, since 2002 and have served, as I said, about 120 nonprofits. And combined, they serve about 100,000 children and their families. And uh, we like to say that um, once a partner, always a partner. So when we graduate our classes of nonprofits, um, we continue to stay involved with them even after our services have ended through our network and by providing ongoing services through community gathering a community of practice, for example. Right. Um, but just want to say a little bit about what the impact is of our work. Um, as a result of working with Fair Chance, we find that nonprofits on average will double the number of children and youth that are able to serve and will double their revenue. So we are like a force multiplier for nonprofits that maybe don't have the brand recognition that others do and are serving in our community's most historically under-resourced neighborhoods and communities. Okay, so how has COVID-19 affected you? I assume adversely because it's harder to raise money and I assume children are in greater distress than before, but is that wrong? Tell me how COVID-19 has affected you and your organization. Well, we did an, an, a survey with our network of nonprofits um, right when this began, the second week of March, um, at least right, right when uh, we began uh, staying home and schools were closed. And uh, what we found from our network was about a third of them were finding that they were having to close their programming or partially close their programming because many of them work face to face with young people. Um, but the other two thirds were incredibly resilient were doing everything that they could to identify what the right technology platform was to deliver tutoring or 
um, you know, tele mental health counseling. And uh, my office and my staff of incredibly talented professionals were coming alongside these organizations to help them figure out what is the right technology platform and to apply for things like the payroll protection program, which was a, a really important uh, resource for organizations. And I think many will end up um, really benefiting and not closing as a result of having access to that, as well as other emergency grants that our community has come together to make available to nonprofits. Um, but we've been coming alongside these nonprofits to apply for those things. And right now we're really in the midst of working with the nonprofits in our community right. to do contingency planning, because we don't know what's going to happen coming the fall. Are schools going to open? Are we going to be able to go back to providing the same level of services that we did? Um, or will we continue to have to alter those services um, based on social distancing? So oh, your budget has roughly been about $3 million a year or something like that. Is that all come from philanthropy, more or less? Absolutely. Um, there are some contracts in there, but it's mostly through philanthropy. Okay. Yes. So are people calling you saying, I used to give money to you, but now I don't have as much money? Or are people calling you saying, I have more money than I used to have, and I want to give you some of it? Uh, we are seeing a little bit of a drop-off um, of folks uh, who have been donors, but not really. Um, we've been talking to our foundation partners and most of them are incredibly supportive of the work that we're doing and will continue to, to fund us. Um, I think for most um, nonprofits, the, it's a little different than businesses. The immediate effect is not going to be felt now, but I'm, I'm seeing downstream when we feel the effects of state and local budget cuts and for nonprofits that rely on contracts and grants from state and local governments, I think that there's going to be some, some crisis uh, situations. Um, I also know that many nonprofits, both big and small, rely on special events. Um, who knows what gala season is going to be like next right. fall in Washington, DC. Uh, but like most nonprofits, we have an annual gala. And right now we are anticipating that we may not be holding that live. And even if we do something virtual, the revenue that we expect will be far less. So when you have a gala, how much can you raise in a gala? A couple hundred thousand dollars, something like that? We and usually so raise about a half a million. Half a million dollars. So now uh, you can't do that. And probably you think you won't be able to raise as much with a virtual event, I assume. That's correct. So do you get any money from the federal government? Not from the federal government. Okay. And uh, have your employees, are your employees uh, socially distancing now or where are they? Where are they? My employees are all at home. Uh, we had all, already moved to a kind of a virtual environment uh, and everybody had a laptop and everybody had a Zoom account. And so when social distancing happened, we seamlessly moved into a telework situation. Um, but we um, continue to do what we do, uh, meeting with our nonprofit executive directors and supporting them in developing their boards, in developing financial management and human resource systems, in measuring their results and developing a strategy. So we're doing all that um, via Zoom, via other platforms, and... Uh, all right, so now you've spent 25 years of your life uh, <laughs> in this kind of area of nonprofit uh, assistance. What motivated you to spend a quarter century uh, doing this? Well, I think for most people who are working in a, a position that really is about community development, um, at some point in your life, whether growing up as a part of your family background, um, you began to see that there are inequities in society, um, that there are some people who are more privileged than others, and at some point that becomes something that's unacceptable to you. So uh, I've really dedicated my life to working with organizations and communities that have really experienced um, generational poverty, and structural racism. And we continue at Fair Chance to hold those as values of, of addressing those things. And Fair Chance is just a great place to, I think if you care about those things, get involved. So if somebody wants to make a contribution to Fair Chance, how do they do that? <laughs> well, we take cash check. Um, Where do they send it to? Go to, our money, you go to our website and donate online. And What's we your website? <laughs> what is the website? 
It's www.fairchancedc.org. And, and uh, uh, contributions of what size are you interested in? You get gifts of $500, $100, $1,000. What size do you take? Uh, we will take any amount, David. But I also want to highlight the fact that if you are interested in contributing during this time of coronavirus, our nonprofits are the ones that are working with communities that have been disproportionately affected. And we have a list of all of our nonprofits on our website. And these are the ones, again, that may not have recognizable brands, but if you want to learn more about who's working on the ground in communities every day, making a difference for children, youth, and families, I'd be glad to talk with you about getting involved, either by donating or being on a board of a small community-based nonprofit. Um, okay. So I, I assume you're at your home now. Yes. <laughs> and um, it looks like the Library of Congress behind you, but very impressive amounts of books there. Um, so are you a big book person or something? There's a very impressive looks of, look, look of books. Uh, I am a big book person, um, and I am a part of a monthly book club. And oh. uh, the book we're reading this month is The Plague by Albert Camus. <laughs> very oh. appropriate for the season, I think. OK. so. Um, Right now, the main message you would like to convey is that probably uh, COVID-19 has adversely affected uh, your organization a bit because it's harder to raise money and that if people want to contribute to this cause, they can do so through your website or some other means. Is that the principal message you'd like to convey? Absolutely. But my board chair likes to say we are the best kept secret in Washington, D.C. And I hope that as a result of this uh, interview today, we will not be the best kept secret, but that I also want to just raise the profile, again, of okay. the kinds of organizations we work with, healthy babies, um, uh, light pieces to masterpieces, uh, Little Lights Urban Ministry. Um, these are organizations that are just right. working on the ground and want to make sure people don't forget them as they're thinking about their giving this year. How do you find manage your organization from home? Is it harder, easier? You're going to do more of this in the future? Uh, I think that we are um, going to continue to um, make telework a part of a regular part of how we operate. Um, again, um, we like your, your previous um, guest, uh, we are doing more around communication, I think, because you just don't run into each other in the office. Um, so we're, as an executive team uh, at Fair Chance, we're meeting um, several times a week and we're trying to get uh, information out more regularly to both our staff as well as the nonprofit partners and our donors. All right, Gretchen, thank you very much for letting us know more about Fair Chance and thank you for coming on today. Okay. Thank you so much for this opportunity, David. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to talk to uh, Dr. Wayne Frederick. Uh, Dr. Frederick um, is uh, at Howard University right now. I think he's in between rounds uh, on uh, with patients. Is that correct, Dr. Frederick? I, actually, I, I just got done this morning. Uh, okay. so I'm finished. All right. So let me give an introduction to Dr. Frederick, if I could, a very brief introduction, because his resume is so long, it would take me an hour to go through it all. But basically, he is from Trinidad came to the United States to go to Howard University, I think at 16 years old or so, and got a, a bachelor's of science degree and an MD from Howard, and then later got an MBA as well. He is a surgeon, an, on, an oncologist surgeon, specializes in surgery uh, relating to cancer, and I guess gastrointestinal has been your specialty as well. And then he has uh, been the provost of Howard University, and I think he's now approaching his seventh year as the president of Howard University. Uh, is that a fair summary? Yes, it is. It is actually a very generous summary. All right. So um, let me, there's so many things I want to ask you, but uh, first let's talk about Howard University. Um, you have, uh, you had to close the university down as most universities did. Uh, were you set up to do things remotely? Did you do Zoom like many other universities or did you have all the facilities you needed to do that? And how did that work out? Yeah. So we actually have an, an area called Settler, which uh, assists our faculty with training for online learning and about 50% of our faculty already had training. Uh, so their ability to make the pivot was really, uh, I would say really, really good capacity. The rest of the faculty we trained over the course of that week. Uh, we have used Zoom. We're also using Microsoft Teams. We have um, Blackboard as a LMS platform. And so we had tools to use it. Most importantly, about three years ago, we entered a contract with IBM to 
to overhaul the infrastructure of our technology, all of the hardware, and that was really helpful. Had we not done that, we would not have been able to stand it up. Now, uh, you had a virtual graduation a few days ago. What was that like? You know, it was, um, I would say it, it was the best that we can do, given the circumstances. I, I think it was well done, but it certainly does not replace the long walk. The long walk on our upper quadrangle for commencement uh, is both symbolic and, and meaningful. And the types of people who've taken that walk, those who've gone before us, uh, it means a lot. And I myself have done it uh, three times uh, as, a, as an alum and also uh, seven times as uh, the university's president and uh, once as the provost. So it's a very meaningful day. And we hope to recreate that for the class of 2020 in May of 2021. Oh, so at some point you hope to give them a in-person graduation, is that right? I, absolutely, it's a critical part of what happens here. Now, I think you're involved in another commencement event going on with uh, historically black colleges where President Obama and Mrs. Obama will be involved. Can you explain what that's about? Yeah, sure. So uh, Michael Sorrell, who was the president of Paul Quinn, called me up um, and said it would be great if we could get everybody together to um, really celebrate all of the graduates from the historically black colleges and universities, about 20,000 plus graduates. Uh, he had uh, some connection with J.P. Morgan Chase and some others. And so we got together on a call. I, you know, I told him I endorsed the plan. I'd be happy to support it. And what we're going to do uh, is to really bring quite a few celebrities, uh, some of whom have graduated from historically black colleges and universities, but most importantly, really fat and celebrate uh, the products of our historically black colleges and universities. Okay, so the challenge that all university and college presidents have now is, what do you do in the fall? Do you bring everybody back? Do you do it by Zoom, online? What have you decided to do? So I, I have set up a task force and we're looking at several things. And right now I'll, I'll give you an idea of kind of the framework of what we're looking at. Um, I, I'm hoping that we can bring everybody back later than usual so that we truncate the semester um, and by Thanksgiving, uh, po potentially have a mini semester um, between December and February 28. The reason for that is to get people off of campus in December and February, which are two of the peak flu months. And if the COVID-19 follows that uh, type of spike, that's what we would expect. And then come back from March to uh, March 1st to Memorial Day. Uh, that's one thing to do. Another thing is to keep the high-risk individuals, both students, faculty and staff, I should say faculty, staff and students, off campus as well uh, during the fall at least. But the challenge many colleges are having, particularly with undergraduates, is the college uh, undergraduate experience is one where you tend to live in dorms, people are very close, they share bathrooms. How are you going to deal with that problem? Yeah, well, we still are going to try to get uh, students to really practice good sanitation. One of the reasons for social distancing, obviously, is because of the risk of infection. But when it comes to sharing, uh, to shared spaces, a big part of it is disinfection and what we do in terms of hygiene. And so we really have to promote those. And yes, some people may get infected. So what we're going to do at our hospital as well is try to reserve a couple of wards uh, specifically for students who may need to be self-quarantined or self-isolated. So do you worry that new students you've admitted for the new fall semester or freshmen may say, I'm not coming, uh, it's too complicated, and you'll have a big drop off of students, or are you not worried about that? Yeah, I, I think we all worry about this college presidents, but what we're seeing at Howard is that we're planning and having a class of incoming class of 2,000 to 2,100. Uh, about 2,600 students have actually paid the deposit. The economic impact of what's happening, and if you look at our students are primarily African-American. The African-American unemployment rate is already 17%. You could say that's underreported. It's probably over 20%. That may change in the next 60 days. So we are anticipating uh, you know, some decrease. But I tell you, there's a very high demand. And the types of students we bring to Howard University are really committed and want to get at education. And I think if we do some modifications, we can accommodate them. Now, you said your school is for primarily, uh, let's say, Black uh, students. But you, that's not exclusively the case, what percent of your students are, are not black? Yeah, about 21%. I, I, and I would say we, we, we're not exclusively for African-Americans. Our history uh, said that we were born out of that need uh, to undo, uh, obviously, a significant unequal opportunity. And so predominantly our students are African-American, but we do have a very diverse population from 46 states and 71 countries. Okay, so let's talk about your hospital. Uh, the, the hospital you operate, I assume that the hospital, like other hospitals, is suffering a bit in that 
you have cleared it all everything for COVID-19 patients who haven't really showed up so as much as people thought, and then you don't not doing elective surgery. So is that financially really hurting you? Is I is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. As you pointed out in the intro, I'm a surgical oncologist. I operate on patients mainly with GI cancers. Um, this week on Wednesday, I, I had two major cases to do. One was a patient that needed a major pancreatic operation, and the other was a patient who needed a, a, a uh, had a stomach cancer and needed a stomach operation. And then today, I saw a gentleman with an esophageal cancer. All three patients, uh, have two of them have had their chemo and radiation, so they're ready to go and they would have had their operations this week or next week. So we've put those off now for two to four weeks. So you're absolutely right. Shutting down the elective cases, which really is, the, is a big part of our revenue stream, uh, has hurt us uh, financially. So um, will you expect to get the money from the federal government to help you with your hospital financial problems or not? We have received um, in the CARES Act stimulus, the support uh, from the federal government. But I will point out that uh, it was done based on Medicare um, billing and not on Medicaid billing. Howard University sees Medicaid and Medicare patients uh, make up about 88%. And so our Medicare uh, census is only about uh, 40%. So we did not receive as much as you would think for the types of patients we see. Now, I know of a number of university presidents who also teach from time to time, and you teach as well, but I don't know any other university president who, in addition to teaching, also does surgery. So how do you have time to do surgery? And what do you do if, like, you have a board of trustees meeting and you've got to be an operation? How, does, how do you manage all that? <laughs> so I, I have a really good team that, uh, you know, keeps track of what I'm doing and make sure I'm on time. But to be quite honest, you know, I, I tell people being a university president is far more difficult than being a surgical oncologist. So I go to the operating room so that no one can tell me what to do for a couple of hours, but we really schedule things more elective. I don't take, I don't take uh, on, I'm not on call or take any emergency cases. So you can schedule a lot of what I do electively. And obviously when those patients are in house, if something does go wrong on an emergency basis, I'm there, but I also have a, a surgical oncology partner and the general surgery team also uh, helps support my practice as well. So it, it does work out. Well, first, let me get some free medical advice while I have you. So mm -hmm. pancreatic cancer is a very, very dangerous disease. Yeah. Uh, people don't typically get it till, no, they have it till they're in stage four. So do you do Whipple procedures? How do you, what happens if somebody gets pancreatic cancer? What is the, the, the remedy that you do? Yeah, I do Whipple procedures. As a matter of fact, on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, one of the cases I was going to do was a Whipple and I canceled it just because it's a very involved operation and those patients can end up on a ventilator or need blood, both of which uh, we're trying to uh, reserve those things for our COVID-19 patients. If you have pancreatic cancer, uh, you certainly want to do that. If 100 people get pancreatic cancer, as you pointed out, 80 to 85 of them will show up to us at stage four disease where they can't get an operation. But another 15 would be somewhere in that ballpark. I trained at MD Anderson and we give chemo and radiation up front. And so about 10 to 12 people get an operation and do well when they do. So COVID-19 uh, patients, do you have any COVID-19 patients in your hospital now? We do. About 45% of our census right now at the hospital uh, are COVID-19 patients. Our ICU uh, is filled as well with those patients uh, with about, I would say about 25% uh, of them are requiring ventilatory support. Now, when you have a ventilator with COVID-19, I think I read that it's not always uh, the case that you survive that with when you're on a ventilator. Is that true? Yeah, that's right. The, the mortality rate, unfortunately, with patients who are getting on the ventilators is, is pretty high. It's probably higher than 50%. But I remind people that the ventilator is one of our last resorts. It means that you're in respiratory failure. And if we didn't put you on the ventilator, uh, more likely than not, you would expire. So we're taking the mortality rate from 100%. For those in respiratory failure, adding a ventilator and trying to bring that mortality rate down. So do you have all the equipment that you need? Do you have all the gowns, all the masks, all the other supplies you need? Where did you get that? Was it hard to get it? Yeah, we do. We, we, we get it through our usual supply chain, but we've also been uh, the ben beneficiary of some very good benefactors who have been uh, donating masks and donating other types of PPE uh, to us. And we've stepped up our use, as you can imagine, because of uh, how contagious this virus is, but we are in, in good stead right now. So the biggest problem that Howard University faces right now as a result of COVID-19 is what? What would you say the biggest challenge COVID-19 has presented to you? 
it, it has disrupted our usual circumstance for a group of students that I think are extremely important to the nation. Uh, Howard University, as, a, as an example, uh, sends more African-Americans to medical school. Uh, our, M our business school uh, has sent more people to Harvard's MBA than any other undergrad campus other than Harvard's, as an example. And when you look at African-American students. So with those types of statistics, this disruption has really, uh, really put that at stress as well as the economic impact. So those are two things that we have to look at carefully because we represent, I think, an important pipeline to the nation. What about financial aid? Because uh, the economy is not doing well, I assume more students than before will need financial aid and, and need more than they had before. How are you dealing with financial aid problems? Yeah, so th that's absolutely right. So we, need, we support our students significantly. About 90% of the students who come to Howard receive some form of financial aid. And our institutional aid uh, is significant. It represents about 40 to 45% of a discount for the incoming freshmen is even higher. Uh, so we've been trying to ramp up our contributions um, uh, from philanthropy and also uh, trying to be sure that we have the right mix of students and making sure that we really give as much need-based aid as opposed to merit-based aid. Now, uh, I, you mentioned that you have about 20-some percent of your students are not African-American at Howard, yeah. right? Well, and your patients, is Howard uh, University Hospital, I assume it, it, it's not relevant whether you're African-American or white, you have a mixture of all uh, backgrounds in your in your hospital is that right yeah, that's exactly right that's exactly right during covid though the majority of the patients that we are seeing uh, are african american about 70 percent of the patients now are you living at your house on at howard now or how are you self-isolating do you have children at home or what are you doing sure so i i, I am uh living at home it's off campus it's in maryland cabin gen maryland and I am uh, staying at home as much as I can. I had to come in today, as you pointed out, to see patients. I have a 15-year-old son uh, who is a rising junior, and I have a 13-year-old daughter who is about to graduate from middle school virtually next month, and then subsequently will be in high school in the fall. Are they happy to have you at home so much or not? Yeah, it's been fantastic. Uh, I am now the designated sous chef on the weekends. And so we're having a good time with that. And we're also having uh, three hour dinners, which are resulting in lots of conversation, more, I have to admit, generated by them. So I've been pretty impressed and humbled uh, by their behavior during this period of time. Now you're familiar, I assume, with uh, Trinidad and the Caribbean area. Has that, been hard, that area been hard hit by COVID-19 or not so much? You know, it hasn't been uh, not so much. In Trinidad and Tobago in particular, I've had an opportunity to sit on a committee to look at the health system there. So I'm, I have had an interaction with the prime minister. They've done an excellent job. Um, what they have done is a, probably a little more drastic, but they've done it based on their circumstance. They don't have a lot of ventilators. So they've isolated everybody who's tested positive. You have to go to one hospital and stay there for 14 days. So they've really suppressed it. So the main message you would like people who are watching to know about Howard University and Howard University Hospital now is what? is that both Howard University and Howard University Hospital are, are two of America's greatest romances. Yes. Uh, they represent a strong pipeline uh, with producing diverse talent for a multitude of problems. And I think that as we go through this in particular, Howard University and Howard University Hospital are showing that even with the disproportionate uh, outcomes that you're seeing, Howard University is continuing to produce the solutions for that in our graduates and will continue to do so after the pandemic. Okay, well, Dr. Frederick, thank you very much for letting us know more about it. I appreciate your taking time after you did your rounds and hopefully your patients were, uh, were not uh, getting less of your time than otherwise would get by your having to come back for this, okay? No, they certainly would. Thank you very much and thanks for all that you do. All right, thank you. Now I'd like to talk to Kurt Newman. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Kurt Newman, who has been very involved in the Economic Club of Washington, uh, we had him on our uh, program a while ago, but we asked him if he would come back to talk about something new called Kawasaki syndrome or Kawasaki disease, which has gotten a lot of attention recently because it's a, a kind of an offshoot of COVID-19 problem and it affects principally children. So Kurt, can you tell us what, COVID, what, what uh, Kawasaki syndrome or disease is? Sure, David, and thank you uh, for uh, having me back. It's hard to believe it was only three or four weeks ago we talked and uh, how this virus is uh, changing and the impact uh, across the world and, 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 and have given me an opportunity uh, to talk about uh, this new situation with children. Uh, Kawasaki's disease itself was first described in the 60s 
uh, by a Japanese pediatrician that had to do with uh, the findings that kids would have uh, following a virus. And uh, it could be very serious. And there was a characteristic set of findings. And that has gone on over the uh, last few decades. Uh, and, and people have learned uh, more about it and learned how to deal with it. So uh, as this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, situation began evolving, uh, you know, in the beginning, people weren't thinking that there was much impact in children. Uh, but there were a lot of people uh, that were uh, continued to pay attention. And lo and behold, in England and Europe, they began seeing children that had this very uh, similar syndrome to the classical Kawasaki's. And they made the connection between uh, the COVID-19 infection in these children uh, and these findings that uh, uh, children were having. And now we're seeing it in, in the United States. And we're seeing six to seven children now uh, at our own hospital. There are about 100 reported uh, up in New York. And it's a very serious illness and manifestation of this situation. So um, it wasn't picked up in China because is there some reason that Asians, for whatever reason, do not seem to pick this up? And it's more of a uh, been picked up in African-Americans, United States, or is that not right? Uh, that, that, that's right. And nobody's quite certain about uh, why that is, because if you think about it, uh, the Kawasaki's with other viruses uh, was very prominent in Japan, yet we're not seeing that uh, this syndrome uh, in China and Japan. And we are seeing it in Europe and now on the East Coast. Does that mean the virus changed or is there something about the population? And as we're looking at the numbers, it's becoming uh, worrisome uh, that it does seem to be more prominent and more present in the African-American and Caribbean population. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, uh, research and investigation going on on this right now. And the CDC came out last night uh, with an alert, a warning to all the children's hospitals and pediatricians across the country. Okay, and uh, so how do you know if a child has it? What are the symptoms and how, how, how do you treat it? Right, well, the, the main symptom is a prolonged fever. Uh, and then if you see that with a rash or changes on the soles of the hand, the, the tongue can get very inflamed. Uh, conjunctivitis of the eyes is also uh, uh, something that goes on and then uh, lymph node enlargement. So there's a whole classical constellation of symptoms, but there can be uh, different variations. And so if you see any of those, you need to get into the pediatrician or you need to get over to Children's Hospital right away because early treatment is important. And the treatment is to give something called immunoglobulin, which is antibodies uh, that can help uh, fight this once you make the dis diagnosis. Do you have any uh, children with this, uh, in effect, Kawasaki syndrome disease related to COVID-19 in your hospital now? We do, we have four children now uh, that are uh, under treatment for that. The good news is that the, uh, almost all of them recover. We haven't had any deaths. I think there's only been uh, one or two. It is quite rare, but the worrisome thing is that uh, the incidence seems to be increasing. Now, is that because people are more aware and they're paying attention and looking for it? Or was it, uh, and, and it was there all along? Uh, we're not sure. Or is the virus changing and producing uh, this syndrome? So if someone has a child, and what age is typically are affected, what children are, what age are they typically affected by this? Uh, they're younger uh, children for the most part, uh, six, seven, eight years old, uh, but it can be uh, any age. Okay, so if you have a child that, let's say, has a fever, begins to have some rashes, you should uh, go right to the hospital and, and get treatment right away? Well, you should at least, uh, if, if you can, call your pediatrician and hopefully uh, if they're worried about it, they would send you to the hospital. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of things that cause uh, a fever and, and, and rash. Uh, so I think the pediatricians are pretty much on top of this. Uh, but if you have any question, uh, you know, get over to the hospital. Okay. Uh, so since we last talked to you just a couple of weeks ago, how have things changed at the Children's National? You have uh, more more people coming in with COVID-19 or you have fewer people coming in with COVID-19? Uh, it's uh, it, it increased for a while uh, uh, and then it's uh, kind of plateaued off in terms of the number of children. I think we uh, have about 10 or 15 in the hospital at any one time, uh, four or five on ventilators. Uh, one of the uh, uh, things that we've been finding though, we've been doing a lot of testing. Uh, we've been doing that uh, at a site over at Trinity University, about 100 kids a day. 
the incidence of positives in that group who have mild symptoms has started at around 5, 10 percent uh, and over the last weekend was around 40 percent. Uh, so there's a really increasing number of children that have been infected with this virus. I see. I see. So, um, are you're not doing elective surgery so much right now, or are you, are you beginning to do that? Uh, we uh, have uh, uh, cut uh, down, like uh, Dr. Frederick was talking about, on the elective uh, uh, surgery uh, here at Children's National. Now, we have sites in Virginia and Maryland, and those have opened up uh, where we do ambulatory surgery, and we're starting to do that. We test every child. We test uh, 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 all of our employees to make sure that people know that their children are going to be safe when they're having surgery. So Dr. Frederick is running a university, and he's also doing surgery. Now, are you still doing surgery? Well, Dr. Frederick uh, is a superstar. And the way I know that is I trained him when he was a resident over at Howard, and uh, I tried to convince him to be a pediatric surgeon. Uh, thankfully for uh, Howard and our country, he decided not to do that and is doing what he's doing. I, I just couldn't figure out a way. I don't think it would, in my world, would be good for the patients and families for me to continue surgery. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Kurt, thank you very much for telling us about Kawasaki syndrome. And uh, thank you very, very much for what you're doing at Children's National. Appreciate your coming today. Well, well thank you, David. We appreciate all the uh, support from the Economic Club. Uh, you know, uh, you asked me last time, what could anybody do? And uh, we, we got a great outpouring of support. We're losing a million dollars a day. So uh, any, any financial help or okay. support otherwise. Is a so you're still looking for financial support. You're not having we, given up, right? <laughs> we're not going to give it up. We did get some from the government, thankfully. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we've been around for 150 years. We want to be around for 150 more. And, and the other thing I'd say is people are talking about a second and third wave. Uh, but the one thing that I'm really worried about is the tsunami that's coming around mental and behavioral health for children and families. Uh, that's coming and we need to be ready. Specifically for what? Well, we're starting to see uh, very intense uh, child abuse situations, uh, uh, suicide, anxiety. Uh, kids are not in their normal environment. Their teachers aren't able to watch things. And I think with all the economic disruption, that's going to continue into the fall. And, and uh, we're going to see a lot of that. Okay, well, thank you for letting us know about that, and thank you for coming and everything you're doing. Uh, let me conclude our program today by reminding everybody that uh, uh, you can watch this uh, entire uh, program today on economicclub.org, uh, and you can uh, also come to our event virtually on Tuesday, May the 19th at 5.30, where we'll have a, uh, our scholarship winners this year will be uh, presented with their awards. I want to thank everybody for... Uh, participating today, and uh, we'll be in touch with you on our next program. Thank you, and good day.